everyone. Kyle and Aaron here. So recently, God kind of prompted us with something different, something new. Um, and basically, what we're going to be doing here is doing a video series, uh, three weeks for the whole month of May, uh, on our foster care journey. And so um, some of you may know this, but May is Foster Care Awareness Month. So we kind of felt led to do a you know, this series of videos kind of talking about our story, our journey, and what that looks like. Um, on Facebook, you might see us post things and um, not know the full context of what foster care is and how we got involved with it. So we wanted to shine light on that and answer some of those questions um, and really um, hear from people that have those questions and may be interested in uh, how they can help with foster care and um, support those or be a foster parent. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, so with that, so kind of lay out the format. Um, we're going to have to do this over three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the first week is why we got uh, started in foster care. Uh, second week will be about our first placement um, with little C and kind of the, the, the journey of uh, new parenthood. New parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 yeah foster care and parenthood was the first step in our, uh, our journey. Um, the third week is going to be about our placement with little K and, um, and also that one will kind of wrap up kind of where we're at with foster care right now. So you know, reference, you see, I'm referencing little C, little K. Um, the point of that is for privacy, uh, and, um, security, um, for both them and for us, just some of the policies with foster care. Um, and you'll notice that's also why we have like stickers on their faces, on photos. Um, that's not um, intent. Well, it is intentional, but we would love to you know show their faces. But just for the sake of security, that's why that's there. So, yeah, we're really excited to kick this off. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Aaron to kind of talk about how we got started. All right. Just to add a little bit about you know privacy and security and all that. Just um, as a heads up, like we're not sharing in the coming weeks their story. Um, you know, that is confidential information. It's not ours to tell. Um, and we don't want any stigmas, honestly, for, for them or anyone involved. So um, those are not pieces of information that we will be sharing. Um, I know there's curiosity out there. Everyone wants to know how we got these kids. Um, but those aren't things that we're going to be able to share Um to protect them. So basically, we're going to share our part of it. Yes, how they came to us, but not why. Um, and um, and just our feelings and like I said, like our parenthood adventure and what that started off with and all those type of things. So just wanted to put that out there. Something to keep in mind that is um, expected and not expected. So, all right. Um, you want to talk about foster care in general, what it is? Yeah, so what is foster care? <laughs> so we're talking about foster care, so people might not even know what that means. So foster care exists um, to be a kind of a temporary placement for children um, during moments uh, in their current family or situations where they, where they are um, to provide them uh, just a safe place while parents are kind of uh, going through a difficult time. Um, it could be with housing, it could be, unfortunately, there's cases of abuse and neglect. So um, foster care exists to kind of be that temporary placement for children outside of their normal home. Um, and that's where foster parents come in, the ones that are taking in those, those children for a temporary time for the parents to uh, have opportunities to kind of better their situation and prove that they're... Uh, able to care for the children in a safe and appropriate way. So um, the goal of foster care is always reunification with the biological parents. So um, that's our goal um, for foster care. And yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Very good definition. Nice Thanks. <laughs> so um, I want to give a little bit of background. So I worked in, so in, the social work field, so working in foster care. I was a licensing worker for three years at a private agency. Um, so I licensed homes, I did all the training that you have to do when preparing to be a foster parent. Um, I did ongoing trainings and supports for those foster parents. And then I also did child placement. So I you know, called the foster parents and placed them in their home. Um, 
so after three years, it was time for me to exit that, um, that workplace. And you could definitely call it burnout. Um, did you know that average burnout for foster care workers is two years? So, um, you know, it's a really hard job. And so I just point that out to say, like, if you do get into this and you are interested in um, becoming a foster parent, have grace with your worker because they go through so much. It is a hard job. And so, you know, they have so much responsibility. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that later. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, having grace with them and understanding, you know, that there's a lot of turnover, worker turnover, and other people a lot, professionally and personally, you know, we've heard from, they're frustrated with that, and we've had a little bit of that ourselves in this journey, um, staff turnover, but um, know that they're all doing their best, um, or give them the benefit of the doubt that they are, so anyways, that's where I came from, um, working for three years in foster care and licensing, and then I found a different um, position in a social service agency, early childhood, but no longer foster care. And that was a good suit for me. So, um, and I don't have too much background other than my <laughs> yeah. my family, my sister and brother in law, and their their girls are um, part of an organization yeah. that does orphan care in South Africa. Ooh. Yeah, right there. Right there. <laughs> so, um, now when I left the job there, I knew that it wasn't. We weren't forever done with foster care. I just knew at the time it wasn't right. So, um, you know, thinking back, Kyle and I, when we were just dating, like we knew early on that we both wanted to adopt, that it was going to be in our future. Um, and so six months after leaving that position, um, we started, well, before the six month point, but <laughs> within that time, we felt more of a pulling to go in the direction of foster care. Um, we knew that what the need was and we wanted to start our family. I knew Kyle would be an amazing dad. Um, I've seen him with nieces and nephews and he's incredible with them. So we were excited to start our family and we, again, having the mindset of adoption, um, but also knowing the need of foster care, we said, okay, let's, let's look at what this, what this could be. And Erin would be a wonderful mother as well, obviously. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but when I, you know, so when we started talking about this, you know, we want to be transparent with you guys and share like what our fears and our hesitations were. So yes, we knew what the need was, but it was also in working with it, like I said, burnout had been experienced. So it was very tough and I knew the brokenness of the system. I knew the emotional toll that it took on foster parents and birth parents and these children and how you know, again, things are just not perfect in so many ways. Um, and so I would look at these foster parents and, you know, they would ask me, like, do you think you could ever foster? And I would be like, I don't think so. Like, you're incredible. But I can tell it's very stressful because um, I would talk with them about that. So I would just, the stress level um, took a big toll on me. So I had some, during that time, some bitterness and frustration still with, like, what I had experienced with the system and just how flawed it was and how sad it had um, made so many people, honestly, um, to include myself. But um, so it was a constant pull. So basically, I knew how stressful it was. I knew what it would, um, I guess, the implications, the negative things that could come. But again, we knew the numbers. We knew what the concern was. And I think about you know, all the phone calls, the emails I got, the pictures when they were desperate of the kids that I get from CPS saying, like, this kid needs a home. And whether it's due to sibling size or the age of the child, or sometimes there's even babies, we could not find homes. And it wasn't because people were mean and they don't want more kids or whatever, or these foster parents. It's just they, both physically and emotionally, were full. And they made the decision that was right for their family. But I would call families even after hours and like try to desperately find homes to these families and there's just not enough. There's just not enough families out there, not just at the agency I worked with, but all within the state of Michigan. And um and beyond that obviously. <laughs> but there's such a need. So when we um so again I had negative feelings towards it, but there was that pulling and we felt God putting in our heart and we knew, okay, this is kind of where God is leading us is to go down that direction. Um, but with my hesitations, I said like, okay, God, like, I know this is going to happen, um, but you need to 
unpromptedly tell Kyle, <laughs> like, or without me prompting, you need to tell Kyle, like, he needs to be the one to prompt this to move us forward. We, it was basically the fall of 2017 that we were pondering this, praying about it, reading about it. I'll talk more about that, um, about like how God sees, um, foster care and, and yeah, and to make a decision. So I laid it out before God and said, okay, God, like, I know this is happening, but I'm not sure when, and if you want this to happen, I have hesitations, but I'm willing, but tell Kyle. And then, like, the next day, Kyle's like, yeah, we should do it. Let's go. Let's start. And um, and we did. So, go for it. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely had my uncertainties um, and reservations and, and fears with foster care. And um, some of that stemmed from being, you know, in support of Erin and her job and knowing the brokenness that was there and the difficulties and the system and all that came with that. But um, two major things that definitely kind of weighed on me was just the uncertainty of everything. Um, foster care has no, like, there's no definitive answer. There's no definitive end. There's no, there's, there's this, it's all kind of, uh, it's just uncertainty. It's, it's a constant state of uncertainty. Um, and there's so much that hinges on so many different people. And that kind of, you know, I like to, I'm the kind of person that likes to plan things and know how things are going to work and I'm a processor and I like to make sure that um, things work efficiently and there's, there's not much efficiency in the foster care system. It's very, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of um, miscommunication and we'll talk about that I'm sure at some point, but so there was just this level of uncertainty. Um, and the other piece uh, and yeah, it's like, thinking about uncertainty, like we're all experiencing yeah, uncertainty now absolutely. in COVID. Um, and like, I think God's kind of prepped us for COVID well through foster care yeah. because we're, we're like, yeah, <laughs> oh, two months. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can, we can figure out two months cause we've been in foster care for uh, two years now. And just not knowing what next week's going to be like, like they could call and yep. say like, your kids are going home today. Yep. Like at a drop of a dime. Um, it's unlikely that it would happen like that. Sure. But, but I have it's seen it happen. Possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so uncertainty was definitely a fear. Um, and also just the financial aspect of it. We were, you know, a young family and planning. We have young jobs and just, you know, just starting a family and having kids. And um, we had to consider transportation. We both had cars that wouldn't really handle uh, car seats well. And, um, and just all the other things, diapers and all those things that come with parenting that just fitting into the budget and adjusting. So um, financial planning and all that stuff was kind of a, a factor as well in our home. Like we were, we were going to, you know, move or we we're going to rent a, a larger place, those types of things. Um, and then also, I mean, through all that, like it took me a, a few weeks and months to think about it. And um, I actually read through the processor in me. I, I read some books um, and I kind of wanted to showcase some of them. Um, first one that we read, uh, was Orphanology. Um, this book really does a great job of giving a gospel centered reasons and whys behind, uh, adoption and orphan care. Um, and in some cases in foster care, children aren't orphans. Um, they still have their parents. They're still mm -hmm. alive. Um, so it's important to recognize uh, social orphans. Is that the way? Yep. Yeah, yes. social orphans. So social orphans are those that their parents are still alive, but they're in a, a state, a season of displacement um, and confusion and not having stability. So a lot of um, foster children are more like social orphans, and it kind of it fits into the same reasons and whys of understanding caring for orphans um, that, you know, scripture calls out, um, because these children, they need security, they need stability, they need parenting, you know, roles and figures in their lives that are going to show them God and the father and, um, grace and all the things that they need to develop appropriately. So great book. Um, and the other one that I really, really love and it's more focused on specifically foster care, um, is reframing foster care. And this one just answers a lot of good questions and worries and fears that you may have while entering into foster care, orphan care, and adoption. So I definitely recommend this one um, because it just answers practical questions and also gives practical answers to 
things that people might ask you on your journey and like, why are you doing this? And um, yeah, a lot of good topics in this one as well. So those are, those are, those helped um, me kind of have more of a foundation, a gospel centered focused lens on why we should do this and why God calls us out to do this and understand that's part of our story and what God's calling us into. And then I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. So Kyle said yes. And, um, and therefore so did I in January of, um, 2018. And then we, the next opportunity I got, um, I called the agency that I'd been looking into being interested in being licensed through and we started our orientation. And so, um, you know, we notified all of our family and told them all about it and they already kind of had an idea that we were thinking about it, but we were like, okay, we're doing it. And we had all their support, which was amazing. Um, obviously we had some questions we had some, you know, things that they were curious about and they wanted to know more about it too, because they love us so much and they wanted to protect us. And so we provided all that information to them and what we knew and what we didn't know. I'm going to jump in real yeah. quick. So there is a, something called training, pride training that you have to do. It's a required orientation that you have to go through in order to get licensed. Yes. And Aaron basically ran a pride training for both of our families, um, <laughs> in their basements and, it was it was great, but I, I just thought that was an interesting piece because yeah. Aaron used to well, teach those. First, and then... <laughs> Aaron used to teach those uh, training courses, and so she did my one on one training and then did it for our family. So it was, it was cool. Yeah, so they were all quite aware of what's ahead of us. <laughs> um, yeah, and so because I worked in the job six months prior, um, we got licensed really fast. So I, I trained Kyle, um, and which is a little different, you know, like I said, we already still went to their orientation. We did all the requirements that they had for us, um, to ensure that we were properly trained and we knew what, um, what we needed to do. And we turned all the paperwork immediately and it was just a very fast process for us. Um, typically licensing takes about nine months. So we usually field would say you know it's about the length of a pregnancy from when you first sign up for orientation to when you get licensed and so um the reason it takes so long is because it's very quite honestly invasive <laughs> and like it's just a lot of questions they tap into your health your mental health your um all the safety precautions within your home your discipline styles um how you were raised a lot and but of course they do these things they want to protect the children that they're placing in your home there's reason for it. And I can go a lot more into that if you are interested. Um, they do home evaluations, of course, there's a lot. Um, so it takes nine months, but you know, they came and they did and we gave them what they needed. And we, that orientation was done in February and we were licensed by May. So we got licensed quick. So that was nice. Um, so once Kyle said yes, it was like, go, go time. We made a foster care announcement in April. Um, on Facebook, it was like our version of a baby announcement, but hey, we're becoming foster parents. And mm -hmm. so that was kind of how we did it as an expression of our excitement, how we are beginning our family. Um, and so we'll go, like we said before, more into the next part of our journey in the next um, video. But right now we wanted to kind of stop and talk about a commonly asked question um, or statement that we receive. And it's just in general foster care, foster parents get it a lot, which is, how could you do that? I would get too attached. So do you want to take it from there? Yeah, it's it's a common fear. It's a common statement. I mean, mm -hmm. we get it when we're just walking around. And we get it. We understand why people ask, you know, like. And the, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the statement is like, I could never do that because I would get too attached. And the, the ironic thing about it is that attachment is exactly what the children need. And attachment's almost like in the job description of being a foster parent. Um, because like I mentioned before, uh, these children are in a state of uh, instability. Uh, they're in a state of uncertainty and trauma, honestly. So it's important that they do get attachment. And th this is where there's so many beautiful interweavings with the gospel and what Jesus did for us and is doing for us. Um, and that he ch we choose to attach. We choose to put our hearts, our time, our efforts, our parenting into these, these children that um, may go home. But what we're doing in that is that we're choosing to 
um, give them the stability that they need, the love that they need, the appropriate roles and figures in their lives. So that way, if they do go back home to mom and dad or whomever, um, they have a foundation that is there um, to have an appropriate um, parent-child kind of uh, trust um, and a bunch of other developmental things. Uh, specifically for us, like um, attachment is so critical because uh, we got Chase when he was eight months and we got C <laughs> C when he was eight months and K when uh, she was uh, six days. Six days. And so it's like, like it's so important a development pro developmental progress for them to have uh, appropriate parental kind of attachment figures. So I'll blurt out that maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so absolutely. It's so critical to their, de uh, the, sorry, their development for them to understand that. But Kyle already went over that. So I'm going to bring it um, kind of to us and what that meant for us. We are completely totally attached to these children they i mean yeah they're eight months and six days and we've raised them and it's been two years for the oldest and a year and a half almost for the other and like it's just um we love them so much they are beautiful children um and i can't imagine like what it would be like if we had like put up a wall and hesitated um but when we you know, but when we look at these children that we, we love and we know we might have to give up, we might have to support the reunification home, you know, we just see these children are perfectly designed. And that's something that we need to think about as, you know, these two children are amazing and beautiful, but so are the 13,000 other children in the state of Michigan alone that are in the foster care system and waiting for homes. Um, you know, it is so important that there's more foster parents out there to get attached that they connect with those um, these kids that are in need of it. And just a little further, um, and then we're gonna <laughs> wrap it up, but um, a fear that we had was more so our family. Like we knew we were gonna get attached. Like we knew, okay, heartbreak is gonna most likely be involved. It's just gonna happen. <laughs> and we accepted it. But our family, I mean, they support us, but they didn't say yes to being a foster parent themselves. And so, um, me thinking about them having to say goodbye to CNK breaks my heart completely. And, um, you know, I remember when we first called up and told the cousins and, you know, like, hey, you're getting a cousin eight months old. They were so excited. And to think that, like, we may have to call and be like, hey, they're leaving next week. We all have to say goodbye and, and start that process. And even if we have time to have that process, uh, like, I can't imagine what the cousins will go to through in their little minds not being able to comprehend it but our family is so amazing and so beautiful and you know they all love God and they will support us in that time they will support the kids and each other to know that like we will get through it and it's going to be okay and we will always love them mm -hmm. but also it creates the opportunities for them to yeah. teach the kids what what you know why that's happening yeah. um it's an appropriate conversation. Um, so Absolutely. it creates opportunities. As it does. It, it's heartbreaking to create opportunities. But. Mm -hmm. And just, I want to highlight some of the ways that they've been amazing to, to us um, because these are ways that you can reach out to others. And that's, you know, our family has come in and babysat so many times, <laughs> you know, for date nights or for just going to work or ministry things. Um, and so we can run errands, you know, different things like that. They've given us tons of hand-me-downs and then new clothes um, and new toys. And, you know, sometimes it's for a special occasion. Sometimes it's no occasion at all. Um, they've made meals for us during placement or difficult times. They've picked up the kids from daycare during a time of crunch hour and helped with um, um, visit transportation and things like that. Um, and sacrificing going out of town to help us out with babysitting purposes. <laughs> um, and so it's been amazing. And these are things, like I said, that like has really been our village and helped us during this time and continues to, and they will, um, these are things that you can do to reach out to foster families that you know, uh, make the meals, donate clothes, diapers, whatever it is. Gift cards are incredible. <laughs> um, and if you don't know any foster families, then you can 
reach out to a local agency or church that has a foster care ministry and see like what what can we do and how can we support a foster parent who maybe doesn't have that many supports. Um, those are ways that really foster parents need because so needs that foster parents have because not everyone has that many supports, um, but truly it makes a world of a difference. So our fear is that they're going to get hurt, but we also, our family and us, but we also know that like this is what God has for our family. We appreciate so much the, um, the love and the sacrifice that they've made for us. And so we can all come together and love on these kids and they have all done their part in foster care. So um, you wanted to go ahead and read something from the book. Yeah. So um, kind of journeying back, um, this has kind of prompted me to go back to some of these books that started our journey. And one of the chapters was specifically on um, understanding and embracing a new story uh, and new normals. And I thought just kind of re reading this verbatim is a good way to close out this first session because it kind of encapsulated our heart um, and pushed us forward into the foster care journey. So I'm just going to go ahead and read uh, straight out of the book. Um, while it can be said that foster care is the means by which we may bring about change in a child's life, it's equally true, if not more so, that foster care is a process through which God radically transforms our lives as well. And that's true. That's accurate. <laughs> Their story changes ours, not with easy and light things, but with hard and heavy ones that expose the faultiness in our own stories and begin to produce a new and better stories together as a result. Our world was too small before, our faith was too shallow, our theology too narrow, our dreams too temporary, and our family too isolated, our Christianity too comfortable, our worries too finite, our relationships too homogeneous, and our prayers too selfish. At the heart of the gospel is a radically pursuing God who went to extravagant lengths to enter our story. A God, scripture says, will flip over a house upside down in order to find a lost coin. He'll leave the 99 sheep to secure in the fold in order to chase down just the one that's wandering astray and throw a lavish party for a son that's no longer lost and in the most eternally epic of proportions, step out of the comfort of his glory in order to embrace us and the brokenness of our humanity. And he chooses to wrap himself in the flesh that would allow him to both to be with us and ultimately to be torn for, for us. This is the heart of the gospel and decisively de demonstrated um, through God. Uh, he stepped into our brokenness to be broken by it so we wouldn't have to be broken anymore. And I love this. The beauty of foster care is showcased against the backdrop of the brokenness that surrounds it. The broken system, the broken stories, the broken families. In light of the gospel, it's our privilege to crawl into the stories of others, to wrap ourselves in their brokenness and willingly be broken by it, to exchange our normal for theirs and so begin to craft an entirely new normal and better, better normal together. In the end, everything changes. You change them, but perhaps more importantly, they change you. Nothing can, will, or should be ever the same. So yeah, with that, this is the first video. Thank you for watching, yes, thank you. and uh, we're excited to share more in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, See thank you. See you guys. Bye.